Dear Banks, welcome to your worst nightmare. And Seymour Hirsch bombshell reveals who's stoking war. Hint, it's not Putin. Coming up on today's show. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 9th of February 2022. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, we're going to be discussing how, good news, we got our inquiry into bank branch closures, and this is going to put national banking on the table in this country for the first time in many decades. So, yes, so well done to the supporters out there and the viewers of this show that did their small part, which it wasn't a small part, it created it's creating history. This is excellent news. And then we'll come back to discuss uh, how, according to very prominent, respected journalist, American journalist Seymour Hirsch, the United States blew up the Nord Stream gas pipeline. So this is also a bombshell. Uh, now, before we start, I'd like to encourage people to hit the like button so that this can circulate further. Subscribe to our channel and ring the notification bell so that you don't miss out on anything. We're putting up a lot of extra content lately. Uh, and share this as widely as you can. Comment below. It all helps uh, the algorithm to circulate the show more. Uh, also, I'd like to mention, as uh, we did last week, that people can make a donation to help us in this campaign without which we couldn't do what we just did and create this miracle. That's the point, Lisa. Now, many, I'm also the treasurer as well as the leader. So, I mean, I have the unique uh, responsibility of looking after the funds and spending the money and so forth. And people come up to me quite often. They say, well, how, where do you get your money from? Right, legitimate question. Well, I can tell you, we don't get it from the banks. <laughs> we don't get it from corporate sponsors and we don't get it from the government. I was talking to my wife, who's part of our phone team. We've got a 10-person phone team that talks to between 20 and 30,000 people per year. And these people give us approximately 10 to $15,000, sorry, 10 to 15,000 uh, transactions of money. Very small amounts quite often, but nonetheless, the most significant thing is that that money is put towards, for example, sending Robbie and Glenn, who are both up in Canberra right mm. now, to push forward on the campaigns of getting exactly what the, the viewers out there have helped get is a an inquiry into the regional banking disaster and of course then we can push that for a postal bank so the donations that you give and there's a link down below in the comment section and the, you know down below make a huge difference to us because that's where our funding comes from we are funded by the people we're of for and by the people and we're funded by the people to represent you and I think a long 30-year history has proven that to be mm. what we do and if we did get any funding from the banks, they're about, they would be about <laughs> to quit it right now because we'll move into our first topic. Dear Banks, welcome to your worst nightmare. <laughs> so this inquiry is actually going to be more than what it might suggest if you just look at the terms of reference. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, since the Regional Banking Task Force occurred uh, under the last government, it gave a green light essentially for bank closures by stating in the final report oh, look, we've got bank at post. So, you know, we're going to rely on that more heavily. And there was just a raft of banks, but bank closures that were announced in the wake of that happening. Um, so we put up, we fought for a motion to be put up, uh, which passed this week. And this uh, means that an inquiry into those bank closures will take place by the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee. And we'll just run the video showing it passing in Parliament. I'm going to start with business of the Senate uh, number eight, standing in the name of Senator Rennick. Senator Rennick. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number eight be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Rennick. I move the motion. The question is that the motion is moved by Senator Rennick be agreed to. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Um, and my apologies, that notice is in the name of Senators Rennick and Brockman. Uh, so it passed on the, vote, uh, on the voices, I should say, which means it didn't have to go to a vote. You might be able to hear one ALP uh, MP did make a slight protest, but it made no difference because 
the Greens were fully in support, which means had it gone to a vote, it was known it wouldn't uh, be blocked it's, anyway. It's really interesting, <clears throat> Elisa, in that the most profound sort of decisions come in such an understated yeah. way in the Parliament. But see, all the work's been done before we get to the behind Parliament. Behind the scenes. It's exactly. all done behind the scenes. So this was just a formality mm -hmm. of you know, formalising the process now to move into a new, a yeah. new geometry. Which goes so. to show that you don't have to be in Parliament to make change come about because right. you can bring it to the point where it gets up in Parliament, which is what we've just demonstrated again. We've done it before. And I think it also this, it, it speaks to this attitude that a lot of people have, oh, what can I do? I can't do anything. You know, I'm just a small little person. Mm. Right, and this is, the, this is what the major parties want people to think. Join the Citizens Party, get involved in our campaigns, and we'll take your what you think is a small voice mm and will roar it from the, the roof of the Parliament House. Well, that's right, because there's so many small voices, and we can't mention them all today, that contributed to this campaign. You all know who you are. But just, you know, for any case of an example, James Davis, the CEO of the Shire mm. of Junee, or people like Dale Webster, without whose work we would never have been able to get this up. The amount of hours of work that people like her from the regional has put into exposing the true extent of the bank closures and the destruction of local towns, for example. So this committee, uh, the, the motion was put forward to get the inquiry by Senators Jared Rennick and Slade Brockman, but on the committee also is uh, Senators Matt Canavan, Richard Colbeck from Tasmania, Linda White from Victoria, Glenn Stuhl from WA, and Peter Wish Wilson from Tassie. In fact, you know, we can, you know, it wouldn't hurt to send these people messages. This is a great initiative, you know, we need to do this. Um, in the terms of reference, what is covered is branch closures and the reasons for branch closures, the economic and welfare impact of branch closures, the effect of bank closures and the removal of face-to-face -face cash services on the access to cash, very important, the effectiveness of government banking statistics capturing and reporting um, the situation regarding bank branches, the consideration of solutions and any other related matters. And in a press release, uh, Senator Rennick stated that 19 years since the last inquiry and the devastating branch closures in towns across Australia continue unabated, with more than 80 branches closed or with closure notices issued since September last year. Yeah. And that's basically since the end of that regional banking task force that should have looked at this, but it was too heavily was, dominated by the banks. Yeah. Um, now, Rennick also noted that so, there's a social obligation of the bank to provide services, something which, by the way, is completely uncontested, as Robbie and Glenn noted this week in Canberra. Um, there's a great recognition that that service must be provided and that it's not being done. No protest at that whatsoever. There is a recognition that has to be dealt with. And especially when you consider we've just had the ninth rise in interest rates. Um, of course, the banks don't usually pass that interest rate rise on to the depositors. Uh, and yet, with the high interest rates, as we've reported on previous shows, the banks are making over $100 million a week just on the interest they're accruing on money they've invested that was given to them through the term funding facility. So here they are raking it in and yet, oh no, they've got to squeeze the average mortgager, the families more to keep them going. And they can't afford to keep bank branches open because it's such a huge cost imposition, mm -hmm. right? So this is what's going to be taken on. Um, now also in the wake of this inquiry being announced uh, there will be a push from members of parliament and from councils uh, demanding that the banks that are right now closing their branches cease and desist until this inquiry can uh, look through the implications of that. And so uh, you'll hear, be hearing more about that push. Um, but what it means that this inquiry is up, we want to talk about a little bit because we achieved this, as you indicated, Craig, by forcing the politicians who are protecting the banks um, under massive scrutiny. We made members of parliament who claimed to represent the regions but who've all the time actually been defending the banks, we made them look pathetic actually. And an example of that, I'll put up a tweet um, from Robbie this week, uh, which he says that today, and this is referencing David Littleproud, National Party's leader, 
dropped his mask and exposed himself as nothing but a little proud banker. To my face, he attacked Citizens Party for leading LPOs, that's licensed post office groups, astray down the path of false hope by fighting for a public post bank. Why? He hates a public bank. Mm -hmm. Right, and this is a leader who uh, is losing the, one of the towns in his electorate, Clifton, uh, it's just been announced, is losing its last bank, which is the NAB. Um, but, you know, this is a party that represents or supposedly represents regional and rural Australia. So we've lit a fire. You guys out there lit a fire under the rear ends of these politicians. Um, some of them are going to move to do what he did and try and protect their backside. Others of them are going to move in a much better direction, and we'll give an example of that in a moment, um, and actually come out in favour of these ideas which we're seeing in spades from what uh, Robbie and Glenn reported in Canberra this week. Uh, now, we knew that there was bipartisan support for a public postal bank in the parliament, but some force had to be there to bring it together because you've got so many factions in Parliament that hate each other's guts. And they don't talk to each other, which is a big problem. And yet they agree on something yeah. as basic as this, that the country needs to survive. So it needs um, some kind of intermediate, intermediating group to um, bring that into reality. And we're now in a position where all of the... Act there was hundreds of submissions uh, that... Um, we were given to the Regional Banking Task Force last year. Um, Dale Webster on the regional uh, Twitter account has been tweeting examples. It's absolutely horrifying stories of people that have just been left behind with no services whatsoever. These can actually now be properly scrutinised. Um, this committee has until December to look at evidence and they it's the sort of a references inquiry that can go uh, out to various regions and hold hearings and so forth. They can have expert witnesses come in. Um, and it also, because it references, as I said in the terms of reference, the consideration of solutions and any other matters, um, we will ensure, no, to, no worries about that, that this puts a public bank squarely on the table uh, as a potential turning point in Australian history, actually, to come back to the issue of the kind of national banking activity that built this nation and that got us through world wars and, um, and the like. Well, I hope they keep closing branches, Elisa. Not because well, I want to see the branches close, but because if the banks do keep doing this... They're digging <coughs> their own grave. They're digging their own grave, but they'll also be in contempt of Parliament because we know that there's going to be a call for the cease and desist order. Mm. So here you have the banks not only you know, closing branches in the midst of this important inquiry, mm. you'll also have them ignoring the parliament. Yeah. And this is going to create and polarise the population even more to mm -hmm. exactly push and prove that we need a public-owned bank. Maybe yeah. the issue of nationalisation will come back onto the table. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, this will be the most serious debate of that since 1949, which, we, you know, would be stunning. Um, of course, I don't want to see the branches close in the regional areas, but if the banks are so insistent, mm. they're digging their own grave, as you yeah. say. And um, the worst nightmare of the banks is to have to compete... With, with an actual competitor, not like each other who well, they collude with. Well, you saw that with, with Brian Littleproud's comments. I mean, yeah, look, exactly. So terrified of a public bank because a public bank has, well, look at the profits of the private banking system. Mm. That should have all been reinvested in the Australian economy. Oh, yeah. You know, if it was through a state-owned bank, a through, national bank. Through a national bank, mm. like the old Commonwealth Bank was. Mm. That's, that wealth is being ripped out and put into the hands of basically effectively the shareholders of the mm. banks that are superannuation funds. And yes, they're... You know, our super some, is somewhat invested in that, but that's not the point. Mm. The investment in the public good and the public benefit and the development of infrastructure for the country and so mm. forth is much more important than private bank accounts with money in them. Mm. And other basic things like saving us a mint on in high interest rates from foreign borrowings and that's another everything. Thing, yes. um, now, so as you said, that video we showed at the beginning to get this passed, um, that was the pointy end of an incredible amount of work. So we now want to review briefly how it was done. Now, la on last week's show, uh, Robbie and Richard went through. We had coverage on the Today Show. We had uh, a AAP Wire article on the June E closure, bank closure of the Commonwealth Bank. 
um, which went out across Australia. We can put up some more images of that because um, it was wider than we had even thought. You had Yahoo coverage, the Daily Telegraph, uh, 5AA Radio in um, South Australia interviewed Robert Barwick. We had uh, coverage of a closure in Longreach, um, and which I might add there's been other closures announced just this week. Alexandra in Victoria will lose its last bank on May the 4th, and Holbrook in New South Wales. Um, these are both NABs in Alexandra and Holbrook. Not that one in Holbrook's closing today. Um, but there's been more coverage of including June E this week in about regional. We've had coverage in the Weekly Times reporting that New South Wales has lost 31 branches since the Regional Banking Task Force reported. Sunraysia Daily talked about Robinvale in Victoria losing Westpac, which lost, it lost its ANZ two months ago. And there's a change.org petition circulating to save the bank there. Only the Commonwealth <coughs> Bank is left. Uh, the Adelaide Advertiser had more coverage of Cooper PD losing its last bank, people having to travel 500 kilometres to the next one. The Townsville Bulletin reported on Westpac's in Ingham, Tully and Cloncurry, um, closing on the 19th of May. And uh, in other reports, um, the June e Shire put out a press release releasing the open letter that it sent to the Senate Rural and Regional Affairs Committee calling for an inquiry and that got some attention. Channel 9, uh, as we speak, should actually be, they had said they would go to June E and film on location. The council was planning a big show of support um, from the local community. And I'll also note that after that 5AA interview that Robbie did last week, there was direct motion in response to that from politicians. So, you know, if you make up a big enough stink and it does hit the media, it has an impact. After that, one MP from South Australia we'd been trying to get a meeting with in Canberra contacted us and said, agreed to meet. Um, another MP, the Nationals' Darren Chester, um, we showed on the show last week that he tweeted immediately after that interview. Obviously, they get feedback from this kind of thing and that um, these talk shows have been getting a lot of emails and uh, phone calls from their listeners on this situation. So since um, that time, Darren Chester was interviewed on 2GB uh, Radio, which is another station that's taken it up, the main station in Sydney there. Uh, actually, we'll run an audio clip of Dar what Darren Chester had to say. It was quite interesting because he admitted to the failure of his party, his government's regional banking task force, and called for a moratorium on bank closures. So to his credit, we'll run that clip. Review, we made the difficult decision to permanently close our June E branch, which has had a 37% drop in transactions over the five years before the coronavirus pandemic. Customers who prefer over-the-counter service will still have access to this option with other branches in the region at Wagga Wagga, Kootamundra and Tamora. Now, Friday the 3rd of March is confirmed here, Commonwealth Bank. Friday the 3rd of March is the last day that CBA branch will be open. Now, the full statement is on the website, 2GB.com, because that's the cut and thrust of it, because they gave us this really long spiel, so they must know that they're in a bit of trouble here when it comes to the public. But from next month, June E will have zero bank branches in town. And the Commonwealth Bank complaining about making money out of the June E branch, well, in 2022, they made almost $10 billion in profit after tax the Commonwealth Bank. So I reckon they can leave little old June alone, don't you? Now, I want to make the point that it's not just the Commonwealth Bank turning their backs and shutting the doors on our regional towns. ANZ, National Australia Bank, Westpac, all of them are up to it. 1,600 bank branches have closed around the country in the past six years. Just in the last financial year, 309 axed across Australia. Well, you can understand the people in June E. They'd be filthy at the Commonwealth Bank. And at the end of the day, banks want your business. And if you feel let down, I reckon you should just go elsewhere. But 131873 is the number. We took plenty of calls about this yesterday. And we're going to continue this campaign today. And joining me with his reaction is Darren Chester, the federal member for Gippsland and the shadow minister for regional education, regional development, local government and territories. G'day, Darren. G'day, Chris. 
Now, I focused on the Commonwealth Bank, but I noticed a speech you made in Parliament on this very issue. Can you let our listeners know what you said? Yeah, that's that's right, Chris. I, I spoke in Parliament yesterday, and, and the, the guts of my message was, well, forget about crooks wearing bar- balaclavas. The real bank robbers are the executives making decisions in city-based boardrooms. These uh, corporate bank robbers are robbing country towns of jobs, they're robbing vulnerable people of services, and they're robbing regional Australia of growth opportunities. And what uh, tipped me over the edge, I guess, is in my own lecture to Gippsland, a uh, town of sale with 15,000 people, Westpac announced it was closing its branch in that town, it's a town that's actually growing. And I, I feel the pain of the people of Junee in particular. And that's a, a bustling little regional town. There's some great little businesses there that I've visited myself. And the community's got every right to be filthy about this because these bankers are simply looking at their own bottom line and forgetting that they have a trusted position, a licence to uh, operate as banks in Australia and an obligation to provide services to their customers. Well, at what point does the government knock on the door of the CEOs of the big four banks. And when you're in government, same deal. You knock on the door and say, hey, guys, this is a basic community service. Yeah, no, I think you, you, you raise a really good point, Chris. And the, the Regional Banking Task Force, which was formed by the previous government and reported back late last year, made a, a whole bunch of recommendations. And one of those recommendations was, was requiring the banks to have a, a branch closure impact assessment by the middle of 2023. What I fear is going on right now is these banks are fast-tracking closures to get ahead of that recommendation. Now, I think they've actually looked at the recommendations from that task force and said, well, before they come into effect, let's shut as many branches as we can get away with uh, to uh, to get ahead of the the actual recommendation coming into play. So, you know, my view is there should be a moratorium right now on further bank branch closures until this task force recommendations are actually in place. How do you force the banks- them to do that, though? And this, and this is a challenge. I, this is, you know, I'm, I'm frustrated as a as a member of parliament from a regional area, and we you know watch these we watch these branch closures over a long period of time, and the banks always had plenty of good excuses that there was only you know, a couple hundred people in town, or the town was getting smaller, whatever it might be. But now they're targeting towns with 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 people. These are significant regional communities. Now, they should be looking at other options like co-location with other businesses. So they keep some staff in town. They could do reduced hours. They could have banking hubs. They could have mobile branches. They could do a lot more to make sure that vulnerable people, and I'm talking about people who don't have access to technology, people who maybe don't trust uh, the electronic system and worry about getting hacked, or people who might be vision impaired or elderly, or uh, people, you know, Indigenous people tend to disproportionately use face-to-face services. All these people are directly impacted because they're still using that contact in the bank branch for a range of reasons, and now they won't have that branch available to them in those towns. And I think it's disgusting that these big four banks think they can keep on getting away with it, and so far they have. But why have you let them get away with it, the Parliament? Because this isn't just happening overnight. 1,600 branches closed in six years. The guts of that, Darren, happened when you guys were in government. Yeah, absolutely. And I I accept, Chris, the the criticism and the responsibility as a member of Parliament to uh, perhaps, you know, in the past we've taken the branches, the banks at their word that, you know, this will be the last round of closures, that they've had to do this for business reasons, that, you know, a whole range of things they'll claim that people are going to online banking, which they are. People are using the online services and digital services more. But digital connectivity is not 100% reliable, uh, particularly uh, in some of our regional communities. And I think my yeah, but Darren, point is, some people don't like using it. Phone some banking I'm and a, mobile I'm a, banking. I'm in, look, I'm in furious agreement with you. I look at my mum, for example, as a classic example. She doesn't have great vision and she doesn't really like the thought of doing things online. She would always go to the bank to get some money out when she's doing her shopping. And one of the things about the, when the banks say, oh, you can travel 20 minutes, 30 minutes to another town... Once people do that, they take their other business with them. So if you've bothered to travel 20 or 30 minutes, 50 minutes to another town, you'll probably do other shopping there and you won't shop in your little town anymore. So it becomes a, a tipping point for those smaller towns to lose out on other business as well. And this is, I mean, I, 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 I want to go back to your original point about did we do enough in government? I'd argue that we probably didn't. I mean, there was a Royal Commission into the banking industry and a whole range of recommendations there as well. And we need to revisit this now and say, well, first of all, there should be a moratorium on any further closures. And the banks need to actually understand that there's some obligations that go with their licence to, to actually provide services. And if they're not prepared to um, provide those services, perhaps the Parliament has to have a closer look at their banking licences and put more requirements on them. I would have thought so, because then it's not like the banks are short of a quid. Well, they have a very privileged position in the Australian community. They have a privileged position where they have a licence to take deposits and to, to do their business and, and they make money for their, their, you know, their shareholders and everything else. But they've still got to provide a service to the Australian people, particularly those people who are disadvantaged for whatever reason, who you know 
don't have a computer or don't want to use the technology or don't know how to use the technology or maybe have English as a second language, whatever it might be, there are a whole bunch of people out there who still rely on face-to-face services and the banks are saying, right now, we couldn't give us stuff about you. We're going to shut down your branch and you can drive 50 minutes or you know 100 kilometres to go and access a service somewhere else. Good on you, Darren. I appreciate your time and keep fighting the good fight. All the best, Chris. Have a great day. Darren Chester, the federal member for Gippsland. 131873. Have you seen branches close? I couldn't believe it. 309 branches closed just last financial year. That means towns all over the place, people all over the place in the suburbs of Sydney. We heard it. Kellyville, Dundas, Miranda, Cronulla. Now, also in Parliament this week, Darren Chester uh, gave this 90-minute statement, which was... No, 90 oh, oh, minutes, 90 seconds. <laughs> yeah, that would have been good, actually. There's other MPs that would have done that, yeah, we yeah. know. Um, but, yeah, listen to this 90-second statement. Call to the Honourable Member for Gippsland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And the contempt of banking executives towards regional Australia is well known, with more than 1,600 branches closing in the past six years. And Gippsland, we've experienced dozens of closures in our smaller towns, but now Westpac is going a step further. Now, Mr Speaker, forget about crooks wearing balaclavas. The real bank robbers are the executives making decisions in city boardrooms. These corporate bank robbers are robbing country towns of jobs, they're robbing vulnerable people of services, and they're robbing regional Australia of growth opportunities. Mr Speaker, Westpac has just announced it's closing a branch in the city of Sale, which is a town of more than 14,000 people servicing a much larger agricultural region. It is a town which is the centre of economic activity in that central Gippsland region. Now, Mr Speaker, my advice to Westpac customers in sale is, wherever possible, move your business. Move your business to a bank that still has a branch in your town. It's time to teach these bankers a lesson. Take your money across the street, refinance your home loan. If Westpac executives only want to focus on their own huge profits, it's time to hit them where it hurts. Mr Speaker, it's time for customers to stop being held for ransom. It's time for the corporate bank robbers to receive a message, move your money to another bank. And then uh, another MP on a similar theme was given another 90 second statement by LNP Member of Parliament, Colin Boyce. We'll run that. Member for Flynn. Madam Speaker, last week customers of Westpac's Kinkora Bank branch in Gladstone were notified that their local branch was closing. This bank branch closer joins over 550 branches closed uh, since January 2020 by the four big banks. Bank branch closures have occurred all over the Flynn electorate in central Queensland in communities such as Gladstone, Tenham Sands, Mowra, Billawheela, Theodore, Emerald, Springshaw, Capella, Mundubra. Jinjin, Gainda, Gracemere, Taroom, Wandai and Mount Morgan. Small towns like Mowra have difficulty when they host their annual events like the Mowra Coal and Country Festival, so they have to hire in ATMs to have FBOS available at the Secretary's office. Theodore Bulls and Barrels hires two ATMs, as they can't use FBOS due to poor communications and internet reception. The same thing happens at Jambin Australia Day ceremony. As too many people were trying to access the Wi-Fi, this crashed the system and left people unable to purchase anything. On many occasions, the big banks have advertised customers to use online services. While this may be viable for some people, I have serious concerns for our elderly and those that rely on local bank services. Um, constituents in some communities have to drive hours to visit their nearest bank branch because of branch closes. It is just simply not good enough. It's time for the big, to put, uh, big banks to put their money where their mouth is and continue their banking services in rural Member Queensland. For now, um, 2GB's Chris O'Keefe, who interviewed Darren Chester in the uh, earlier audio clip that we just played, he had already interviewed James Davis from Juni Shire and then Robert Barwick as well. So he's pretty fired up, and that's mm. indicative of the kind of response you're going to get the more we spread the word on this. Well, this impacts every single person in the country, whether they realise it or not. Mm. And as soon as the major media gets involved, like they are now, this goes from just being a small brush fire into a full-on bushfire. Yeah. And this is what the politicians are, are, are starting to sniff. Mm -hmm. 
And this is why, you know, with the very wide terms of reference that are coming up, mm. we have and we will make sure that the postal bank issue is put on the table as the only solution. Nothing else is going to work mm. here. So this is a brilliant breakout for us and for the, uh, you know, when I say us, I mean the people, um, to actually stop these predatory banks from pushing their agenda, which has got nothing to do with profitability or whatever. Mm. It's got everything to do with becoming a cashless society, getting rid of cash, right, and making everyone a prisoner of the banks. You lose your cash, you mm -hmm. become a prisoner of the banks. Yeah, right when the global financial system is teetering on the edge of collapse. And just to add to that list of things, uh, Dale Webster also did an interview on ABC Radio in far north Queensland. And I've most likely forgotten some other things, but there's been so much that's been coming thick and fast, it's hard to keep on top of it all. Now, in Canberra, just to give a, the brush strokes of what uh, Robbie and Glenn uh, in, got in terms of feedback this week, and they can say more about that next week, um, but we showed, and we can put up an, a sample of this, we made charts out of all the bank closure figures that Dale Webster's pulled together, and a lot of MPs from the different regions were actually shocked to see. They really, I mean, APRA should do this job and pull these figures together, but they don't. No other they political, hide it. No, no other political party, Elisa, you know, works with people to be able to pull these figures together and then take it to the politicians who I'm afraid are ignorant. Mm. That's right. Not, it's and not necessarily busy, so their fault because there's many different things. But if you're mm. not in that parliament, you know, putting out press releases on this subject, getting immediate attention because you put out and do the work, mm. then what happens is these important issues don't get brought into uh, high relief with the people that can actually do something about it, which mm. is these elected representatives. Yeah. And look, we had excellent responses from um, all parties. I mean, there's, I'm not even sure the final number, but at least a dozen or more meetings that they've had up there and more on the sidelines, unofficial meetings and things. Um, but there's a real pro-public banking streak, even from politicians that we kind of le least expected to hear it from. And some had basically said to us that they've been um, in favour of this for decades and, or years um, and they've given up on people in their own party you know in terms of supporting this and then we were able to inform them well hang on there is someone in your own party that's in favour of this oh, oh you know so we're bringing together um, the the foundation for, of support for this one MP told us that he was stopped in the street to, and someone wanted to congratulate him for fighting for this initiative uh, we had an activist who reported from a another state that his MP had talked to Treasurer Chalmers and Finance Minister Stephen Jones about this and they claimed to be looking at expanded banking functions for Australia Post. Um, Bob Catter is, as people would know, going to table legislation for a public postal bank. That could happen very soon. That could happen within days or weeks. Um, actually, I want to run another clip. Um, you can see on the screen that CADA members of parliament put a press release out this week pushing for a state-owned bank. And they got coverage from that because, again, this is a big issue. So Channel 7 ran this clip. It's hard enough to get to the bank with reduced hours in regional Queensland, but it will be made even more difficult when Westpac branches in Ingham, Cloncurry and Tully are closed completely. If there's no bank here, then... What are we going to do? We've got to go to Townsville. It's as painful as it is already with the other banks closing early. From May 19, banking in these locations will only be possible through the post office. We're losing everything from our newspapers through to our, uh, you know, the services that we expect through Queensland Health. Staff were told of the changes this week. You've got a number of staff that will be left high and dry. Two in the Ingham town will lose their jobs. In a statement, Westpac says its customers are using branches less for fewer reasons and choosing to use digital banking more often. No, you're forcing them to shift to work towards digital banking because they have no choice. Once they move to election, electronic money, your freedom, your control of your lives ceases to exist completely. Nick DiMetto fears for his electorate's ageing population. A lot of those elderly people either don't have smartphones, aren't savvy with internet banking and with the amount of scams going around online are scared. Paige Van Luntren, 7 News. So yeah, we are in the box seat 
to get a public bank and the way that this would transform Australia would just be incredible. It opens all kinds of doors and windows that you wouldn't even imagine possible to develop this nation. And again, Lisa, I have to thank all those people that have contributed, made donations to help us do this work over the recent period. Mm. And I encourage people, please continue, help us continue our work to reach out and expand this. Click on the donate button down below. And what you may not know is that donations to a registered political party like ours are tax deductible up to the amount of $1,500. So if you've got if you're interested in doing this, then please, please do it. We've given you the, uh, the, 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 the results so far. Next week, I know Robbie and Glenn will come back and give you more insight as to what we've been able to achieve. Yeah, no, that should be good, so stay tuned for that. Um, now, we will, of course, let you know as soon as we get the details of people making submissions, because I'm sure all of our viewers um, can make a submission to this inquiry to tell your stories about um, the um, problems that you've experienced as a result of bank branches or ATMs having been shut down. So stay tuned for more on that as well. Um, on to our second topic. Seymour Hirsch bombshell reveals who's stoking war. Hint, it's not Putin. <laughs> this is phenomenal. This is unbelievable. This Lisa. is a really big story and we'll put a link below. I urge people to go to Seymour Hersh's Substack page and read the full article. It's about 5,000 words. It's not overly long, but it's longish. Um, now, Seymour Hersh, of course, is a veteran investigative journalist who wrote as a staff writer for the New York Times and the New Yorker. Uh, he'd been more exiled in recent years, but now that there's a lot more alternative media like Consortium News and other sources around, he gets published by those kind of um, uh, networks. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist for his expose of the My Lai massacre in Vietnam. He's written major exposés of illegal CIA domestic spying um, and related things. So, and he, I will add, has an impeccable retinue of sources. Uh, some of the sources for this particular article he's put together are, um, you know, people within the Pentagon, CIA, etc. I think, Lisa, you know, in our discussions, you know, the reason this article has come out is because people have made available to Hirsch information that they want to see in the public domain because they don't want World War Three. They mm. see what Biden's doing, they see the direction the world's going, and they say, this is insane, we've got to stop it. So they're using someone like Seymour Hirsch to blow the whistle mm -hmm. on these dirty and corrupt and disgusting operations that are being run in order to foment war, which could lead to third, you know, a third world war or nuclear war. Mm. So the story is about, um, as people would remember in the news at the time, uh, the explosion that occurred wrecking the Nord Stream or North Stream gas pipelines. There's four of them that connect, uh, that bring gas from Russia into Europe. This occurred on the 26th of September 2022. So what Seymour Hirsch has stated about this, um, he's very blunt in his assertions. He said, last June, US Navy divers operating under the cover of a widely publicised midsummer NATO exercise known as Ball Tops 22 in the Baltic Sea planted the remotely triggered explosives that three months later destroyed three of the four Nord Stream pipelines, according to a source with direct knowledge of the operational planning. Mm. He goes on to say that Biden quote, saw the pipelines as a vehicle for Vladimir Putin to weaponize natural gas for his political and territorial ambitions. Uh, and there's, of course, elaboration of that in terms of um, the geopolitical issues that are at hand here. Now, the White House, as you would expect, has completely denied this story. Um, but it will show in a moment that I don't know how they have a leg to stand on because they've said all the way prior to the war, during the war, uh, that they would cut off Nord Stream if Putin pursued this war. Now, um, Nord Stream was already considered a threat before the war uh, in terms of having diminished Europe's reliance on getting energy from the United States and planning for an attack on the Nord Stream gas pipeline went into motion before 
Russia launched its special operation in February last year. So in December 2021, the previous year, planning started in a special unit within the administration to have this or have some scenario devised that would interrupt those gas pipelines. Um, Hirsch, one of Hirsch's source said that it had to be covert. So there was a lot of planning that went on because as the source put it, it's an act of war. Well, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. it is. Definitely. Um, and so they obviously they knew they had to keep it quiet, but now it's being revealed. Uh, in mid-January 2022, so the following month after this planning unit had been established to figure out how to disrupt the supply of gas, the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Victoria Newland, who had been one of the key instigators in the Maidan coup in 2014 that set all this off, she said, if Russia invades Ukraine one way or another, Nord Stream 2 will not move forward. And then on the 7th of February, just 20 days later, 2022, Biden gave a press briefing in which he said, if Russia invades, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We will bring an end to it. So whether this was inadvertent or not, because they were meant to keep it secret, who knows? But look at this two minute video comp compilation, which shows American leaders and congressmen, including the comments that I just read from Newland and Biden, um, calling for that pipeline to be shut down. It's blatant. The sledgehammer that we have against Putin is to shut down the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and do it permanently. This is a real, acute and proven threat. I'm a big proponent of uh, making sure we stop Nord Stream 2 from, from happening. Stopping the Nord Stream 2. And we need to, the and chancellor we need to be is going there right after now. Uh, assets like the Nord Stream 2. And, you know, Trump also isn't wrong to identify Nord Stream 2, this pipeline that pipeline. he talked about today, as problematic. There is still time to stop Nord Stream 2 if we act quickly. The timeline for action is short. And I'm not going to stop working to halt Nord Stream 2 to stop Russia. End it once and for all. I mean, he needs to kill the, key, uh, the Nord, Stream, uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline right now. And I think the most important thing right now, and what Zelensky said is, they want Nord Stream 2 stopped. Mm. That's what I see as the most tangible reason and the tangible uh, effect. To I believe we must stop this Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And we should have brought the project to an end. There's still time to stop it, but we need to act quickly. Nord Stream 2 is danger is a danger to peace as we know it. Nord Stream 2 is energy blackmail. It's Putin's pipeline. It's a trap uh, for the a Russian trap. There will be uh, we there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. It, we we will bring an end to it. We will put an end to it. Germany should cancel the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. Uh, we're looking at a variety of things we could do there. We've been so far using trying to use other tools to stop the Nord Stream 2. And we got legislation that was appropriate to and now have delayed this project significantly. We need further tools. We're prepared to use those tools should you provide them uh, to us. Uh, and, and we've also used our diplomatic capabilities. This pipeline must be stopped. And the only way to prevent the completion is to use all the tools available to do that. If Russia invades Ukraine, one way or another, Nord Stream 2 will not move forward kill Nord Stream 2 now and let it rust beneath the waves of the Baltic. The operator of the Nord Stream gas pipelines, which run between Russia and Germany, says that three lines on the Baltic seabed were damaged on Tuesday. It was a, a deliberate act of sabotage, and now the Russians are pumping out disinformation and lies. This is uh, clearly a, a, an act of sabotage of some sort, and, and Russia is certainly the most likely co uh, suspect and we killed that pipeline dead. Now, Seymour Hirsch then goes through some detail based on what his sources had to say about uh, the planning uh, to put the, the charges, to place the charges, the detonation charges mm. onto the pipeline itself. This was done in cooperation with Norway and their Navy. Uh, and then they had to figure out because um, they didn't want the explosion going off right after they were there during that bull top exercise. So they wanted to figure out how they could have it there and then detonate the charge at any time of their choosing, which was quite involved quite a lot of technical detail. And in the end, the 
the setting it off was based on a sequence of low frequency tones because anything else could set it off like an earth tremor or a big boat going through the area so they had to develop a special way of doing it using a uh, a sonar buoy that in the end was dropped by the Norwegian Navy according to the story um, and the detonation eventually occurred on the 26th of September 2022 and remember Russia was blamed for it uh, albeit that all the investigations that have happened into this the official investigations have turned up not a skerrick of evidence and why would Russia do it anyway to their own delivery of gas which is part of a crucial economic component where on the other side the US were sanctioning Nord Stream as part of their sanctions regime. Um, but now, um, I haven't seen extensive Russian reactions to this yet, but so far the spokeswoman Zakharova is demanding that the White House comment on all of these facts. Um, and just to put it into context, this is coming in a, you know, a very tenuous period where in the recent period, as we've reported in our Australian Alert Service, there have been admissions from those people involved that the Minsk peace procedures that were implemented in 2014 after the initial Maidan attack, which hopefully would have prevented this special military operation as it came about last year, um, people involved in doing that, including um, German Chancellor at the time, Angela Merkel, the French President Hollande, uh, the Ukrainian President Poroshenko and the latest of which is Boris Johnson have all admitted that was never a serious peace process, but it was actually just to buy Ukraine time so NATO could arm them, they say supposedly so they could defend themselves against a Russian attack. But in, in that period, Russia was aware that Ukraine was building up forces for a major attack on the people living in the east part, the self-declared republics. And so Russia knew that they had to defend those uh, majority Russian citizens. Um, there's more evidence emerging that Boris Johnson blocked a attempted peace negotiation in April last year. Uh, and that includes the fact that Israel's then Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett, had been mediating a peace agreement which both sides wanted to pursue. This was just month after the special months after the special military operation had commenced. They really, both sides could see they had nothing to gain from this. But that attempt, Bennett said, was blocked by the US and the UK. And Boris Johnson, you know, he was there. He um, talked Zelensky out of it in April 2022. Um, and he's just been there again, pushing for more weapons to be sent in just before the tanks were agreed to be sent by the US and by Germany. And he's also pushing for NATO admission into Ukraine. It's coming amid other escalations where the head of the UK Defence Select Committee in the House of Commons, Tobias Elwood, has just said we're now at war in Europe. We need to move to a war footing. We need to face Russia directly rather than leaving Ukraine to do all the war work. That was on Sky News on the 30th of January. The former British Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for International Security Strategy, Sir Gerald Howarth, has just said that it's time to consider putting NATO boots on the ground in a Washington Post interview. We've had, of course, uh, our Foreign and Defence Ministers Penny Wong and Richard Miles uh, over in uh, the UK and meetings in France. There's been AUKMIN, the Australia-UK ministerial meetings, where we're basically locking ourselves in to support Ukraine in this march that may result in boots on the ground and possibly Australian boots on the ground. And you can read more about that in the Australian Alert Service, which we've written up this week. Paul, you look at the United Kingdom, you know, it's a basket case economically. I mean, people are starving, people are freezing because of their, econ their economy is just completely crumbling. Mm. The war, the push for war always has a, an economic basis. And that is to, first of all, distract people. But in the case of the West, mm. look at the fight that various countries are now having with inflation and the sort of austerity measures that are now being brought in globally. This is this the and, and many countries are looking at this and they're saying, is this really what we want to have mm -hmm. for our country? Is this the, are we going to follow this Western model of austerity? Are we going to follow this Western model of deliberately blowing up pipelines like the United States has just done. Yeah. Is this the model of the sort of country we want to you know, follow, like in the mm. case of the United States? But then they look around, they see the incredible collaboration between China and Russia. 
They see the building of the coalition of the BRICS countries, Brazil, China, Russia, India and South, Af South Africa. They see the tremendous economic development and cooperation amongst those countries. And more and more countries are saying, we don't want to have a bar of the West mm. anymore. There's new currency you know, blocks developing outside the US dollar. Yep. So you sort of wonder why, is the, why are these forces pushing for war? Is that they have no compunction to blow up the entire war if they lose control. And that's the real danger here of World War Three. That's Lisa, right. And, and that, nuclear war. And we've just talked about Russia, but you know, on the China front, we've just seen, you know, US fighter jets blowing a Chinese um, weather balloon out of the sky. The I half mean, million dollar missile, yeah. Talk about, um, you know, any trigger, the slightest, ridic most ridiculous thing that could trigger World War Three. You know, in Australia, in the media today, they're screaming about surveillance cameras because they're made in China, in government buildings and so forth, like ASIO wouldn't be on top of that kind of thing. You've had um, this four-star US Air Force General, Mike Minahan, people would have heard telling his officers that we'll probably be at war with China by 2025. Um, a US Marine Corps com uh, general, who with David Berger, was just down here in Australia saying, you know, we'll have to use everything in the cupboard to avoid conflict over Taiwan, but we can't slow down, we can't back off from confrontation with China, we've got to take these guys on, etc. Um, but as you said, on the other side, and it's a reflection of what we're seeing in the Australian Parliament that we've just been through, uh, a growing coalition of countries that are fighting for peace. I mean, um, French economist Pierre de Gaulle, who's the grandson of President Charles de Gaulle, just warned on the 1st of February that the world is on the edge of the abyss of World War III because Western politicians, he said, do not understand either the history or the consequences of their actions. And that's very, very true. And that's why we're urging people to, you know, get informed and you can contact us for a complimentary copy of our Australian Alert Service. The stories we talk about every week on the show are sourced from our own research and work and collaboration with like-minded people all over the world. Uh, and that chorus of voices is growing stronger and stronger. Our own um, associate here, John Lander, his um, speech to the um, Committee for the Republic in the United States was just given prominent coverage by veteran American columnist Patrick Lawrence in an article published by Shia Post. So, you know, the word's getting around across the world that Australia does not want the US to come and protect us from big bad China. We do not fall for that for one minute. You're making us the next Ukraine, putting us in the firing line by pushing this line. Uh, we need collaboration with our neighbours, not confrontation. Yeah, and if you, wanna, if you don't want to see these policies continue, particularly here domestically, if you want a postal bank, get involved. Yeah. Because then you can't, you, you can't complain if you're not getting involved. If yeah. you're not rolling up your sleeves and campaigning with us, then please don't complain, you've got no right to. <laughs> So contact us and get involved. That's yep. your marching orders. Um, that's all we've got time for this week. Thanks for tuning in and see you next week. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.